The Bible's New Testament begins with the book of Matthew. Like the three books after it, known as the Gospels, it tells of the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Written in the latter half of the first century, many scholars and historians believe it was written by Matthew, one of the disciples of Jesus. Matthew was a tax collector in the area of Capernaum for the occupying Roman authority. He would have been wealthy and, as a tax collector, viewed with disdain due to the common corruption of the trade in that day. Bible teacher Michael Carr takes us on a journey to Israel, the land of the Bible, to explore the life, times, and words of Matthew, words that prove the identity of Jesus Christ as Messiah and what that means to those who choose to follow him. As Jesus continues his summary statements in chapter 7, he finally comes to the matter of prayer. His teaching is, is manifestly simple. It's very childlike. If you ask, it will be given. If you knock, the door will open. But then he uses another very powerful illustration. I think we've listened to it too much. It's lost its power. So imagine a parent whose hungry child comes and asks for bread, and that parent gives them a stone instead. Or if that same child asks for a fish, you, you give them a detestable uh, snake. You know, you can see Jesus' listeners just shuddering. No, no good parent does that. And Jesus very rabbinically says, well, how much more will God give to those who ask Him? See, our confidence in prayer is based on the nature of God who is a father, a, a better father than any of us could ever possibly, possibly imagine. Our confidence in prayer is not rooted in our ability to pray, but in the manifestly loving nature of our Father, a Father who gives good gifts to those who confidently and persistently knock. My favorite spot in all of Israel, Capernaum, Jesus' own town, the Gospels call it. This is the place Jesus moves to after he's kicked out of Nazareth. Here he lives with Peter. A story takes place here in Capernaum that's a, a wonderful example of Matthew being what we call a selective minimalist. Basically, he takes stories that the other Gospels use, but then he severely edits them and then uses them in his own way. Luke tells the story of the faith of the centurion. It's twice as long. Luke uh, tells us about the elders of the synagogue coming to Jesus, and there's a whole extra layer to the story. And Luke uses this story to teach the fact that the, the kingdom is now upside down. The outsiders are on the inside, and the insiders are on the outside. Matthew uses this very same story. He leaves out the elders. Only Jesus and the, and the centurion are on the stage. And Matthew uses this story to teach about the kingdom, one of his favorite themes. And in Matthew's telling of the story, the conclusion is that those who have faith, be they Gentiles or not, are going to enter the kingdom first. It's a completely different purpose for this story. Now in the end, Jesus does heal the centurion's servant but it's almost an afterthought. It's a little sentence at the end of the story because the real miracle is the faith of the centurion.
We're here in the synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus' own town. And the synagogue is the perfect place to talk about the Gospel of Matthew because Matthew's followers, the first readers of his Gospel, are Jewish believers who are still part of the synagogue community. One of the ways you see this in the Gospel of Matthew is only Matthew tells us of a scribe. Now the scribes are usually bad guys, right? There's a scribe who comes to Jesus in chapter 8 and wants to follow him. He volunteers. He doesn't understand that Jesus doesn't accept volunteers. He calls disciples and so he dissuades him by saying, you know, foxes have dens, birds have nests, son of man, he has no place to lay his head. The very next thing that happens is one of Jesus' disciples. Now Matthew uses that word disciple five times to describe people who aren't committed followers, but they're just sort of following along. And this is one of those guys. He comes to Jesus, he wants to follow him, but he makes an excuse. And it's the most valid excuse in all of Judaism. He needs to bury his father. That's the, your, your, your prime responsibility in the old orthodoxy is to bury your parents. But this is the new reality. This is the kingdom we're talking about. The kingdom comes first. It exceeds the old obligations. So Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. You, you follow me. Matthew is, I think, very interested in this story because when Jesus called Matthew, he left everything and followed Jesus. This is a great day on the Sea of Galilee to talk about a storm. We don't have quite a storm yet, but the wind is blowing. There are two stories that need to be understood together. The story of the demonic storm and the story of the Gadarene demoniac. They, they occur right next to each other in, in all the Gospels. Matthew tells us that they get in the boat and they're going across the lake when a tremendous storm unlike any storm the disciples have ever experienced. Matthew calls it a seismos, a shaking. There's this demonic shaking of the sea and the disciples are terrified. Even more terrifying though, as they look in the back of the boat where the person who usually steers the boat is sitting and Jesus is asleep. They wake him up, they wake him up and they're terrified. He seems surprised, a little disappointed that they're afraid. But here's the point. Jesus says to the storm just what he says to demons. Be muzzled and the storm dies down. See, this was a demonic confrontation. This is one of the examples in Matthew's gospel where Satan is trying to kill Jesus. It happens again and again in Matthew's gospel. The very next story, again, we need to understand these stories together. They come into the harbor at Gadara. Now we imagine them pulling the boat up on the shore, but that's probably not what happened. There was a, a massive pier, 600 foot long pier in Gadara. So they pull the boat up, they tie up to the pier, and the first thing they hear is the screaming of two demonically possessed men. Remember, Matthew doubles his witnesses. The other gospels tell us of one demoniac. Matthew lets us know there were actually two. But again, this is another story about demonic confrontation. And Jesus rebukes the demons, and these men are freed from their suffering. These stories are really stories about identity, about Jesus' identity. In the storm, after Jesus calms the sea, the disciples ask, who is this man? It's really, it's a question of his identity. When Jesus gets to the other side, he demonstrates his power over the demonic by delivering these two men. Who is Jesus? He's the one who has power over the demonic. Here we are in my, my favorite place in all of Capernaum, a spot that we believe is Peter's house. We believe this because if you can see this octagonal wall, uh, this was made uh, into a church fairly early. So there's a very good chance anyway that this is Peter's house. So much happened here. Uh, and one of the stories in Matthew 
uh, took place here. Now remember, Matthew is a selective minimalist, right? He takes stories, but he edits them down. And we read in Luke that when Jesus is teaching in the house and the house is filled with people, that two men have to actually dig a hole in the roof and lower their friends down. Guess what? Matthew is not interested in that detail. It's not there. Matthew is interested in the conflict between Jesus and the scribes. In healing the man, he first says, your sins are forgiven. And they don't like that because only God can forgive sins. And when Jesus hears this controversy brewing, he asks them a very rabbinic question. What's more difficult? See, very rabbinic. What's more difficult? to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. Of course, they have no answer. And Jesus turns to the man and says, get up. This absolute authority that Jesus has, and he gets up in front of this huge crowd. Interesting story. What's even more interesting to me is the response of the crowd. And this happens every time he does a miracle. No one praises Jesus ever, ever. When Jesus does a miracle, he always wins praise for God and the people praise God when Jesus heals the paralytic. They're praising God that he's given such authority to men. See, Jesus always points away from himself and he always, always wins praise for the Father. We're just outside of Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee where Matthew probably had his toll booth, the place where he collected taxes for Rome. In chapter 9, the chapter is filled with miracles. And in with all these other miracles, Matthew includes, I think, what for him is the greatest miracle, his own conversion. Now he works for Rome, he works for Herod Antipas, and he's responsible for collecting taxes some people believe he was collecting the fish tax. Josephus, who at one point was governor of Galilee, tells us that the Galilean province, along with one other province, were responsible for $5 million of taxes every year. So Matthew was responsible for collecting part of that. It's a big burden. Jesus comes to him and says, follow me, issues the command. Now Matthew, like the Roman centurion, he understands Roman authority. And apparently he recognizes in Jesus an even greater authority. And more than any of the other disciples, Matthew left vast wealth. He simply gets up from that table and walks away from everything. After he becomes a follower of Jesus, the first thing Matthew does is give a banquet. That sort of makes me appreciate him. Matthew probably lived here in Capernaum and these are uh, the remnants of the houses in Capernaum. Just below that church is actually Peter's house. So it might have even been one of these houses where Matthew celebrated the fact that he'd become a follower of Jesus. Pretty cool idea. But during the banquet, uh, there's a conflict between Jesus' followers and, and the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees represent the old orthodoxy. And here is Jesus uh, seeming to condone Matthew and, and his uh, crooked friends by having meal fellowship with him. Uh, the Pharisees are really right. Jesus shouldn't be doing this. But they don't understand the new reality. And I think one of the most fascinating passages in Matthew happens here. Jesus looks at the Pharisees. He quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. He says, go find out what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Way back in Hosea, there's this, this hint of the new reality that what God really has wanted all along is mercy, loving kindness, hesed, and not mere sacrifice. Jesus will quote this again later on. Matthew has it twice. Jesus giving the outline for the new reality. Now this is a crazy idea and I'll just leave, leave it to you to sort this out. 
But after 70 AD, when the, the great rabbi, Ben Zakkai, is reforming Judaism, trying to figure out what can they do now without the temple, and guess what their guiding principle was? Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I just wonder, and this is the crazy part, I just wonder if Jesus' statement twice to the Pharisees in Matthew had some sort of impact on their decision. Right after this long discussion of the new reality and the old orthodoxy, Matthew gives us two stories about the, the triumph of the new reality over the old. The first is a synagogue leader. We're standing in front of a fourth century synagogue in Capernaum, but underneath it, directly underneath it, is the first century synagogue donated by the Roman soldier where Jesus would have taught and where this man who now comes to Jesus would have had responsibilities. He represents the old orthodoxy. His daughter is sick and there's nothing he can do, nothing but, but uh, get ready for her funeral. And Jesus gets up probably from Matthew's banquet and follows along. Then the story is interrupted uh, by another story about old orthodoxy, new reality. There's a woman who's been hemorrhaging and she reaches out and touches the prayer shawl, the fringe, the tzitzit, the fringe of Jesus' prayer shawl. I mean, what, what better sign, what better symbol of the old orthodoxy is there? She touches that fringe and she's immediately healed. For the first time in human history, an unclean person touches a clean person and the unclean person is healed, becomes clean. Jesus goes on to the house of the synagogue ruler. Matthew cuts the story literally in half. He goes inside and he wakes up the little girl. Now, get this with me. The new reality is death is only sleep from which Jesus will someday awaken all of us. The very next story after the raising of the little girl is the story of the two blind men. Now, only Matthew tells us this story. Remember, he likes to double his witnesses, so there are two blind men. Apparently, Jesus takes them back to Peter's house, which is just a few yards uh, to my left. He takes them back to the house. Inside, he asks them, do you believe that I have the power to do this? And they affirm, yes. So he speaks the word and they're healed. You see, they came and they asked for mercy, which is uh, a request that Jesus never denies. If you ask for mercy, which is by definition something you acknowledge you don't deserve. Jesus is always going to grant that request. Then something unusual for Matthew happens. Now Mark is very interested in the fact that Jesus will heal people and then strictly warn them not to tell. This is one of the rare examples of that in Matthew. Jesus tells the two blind men, you know, don't tell anyone that I did this. But they always tell. I mean, how can you not tell? So why is Jesus always telling the deeply grateful individuals he's helped to not tell anyone? He does this three times in Matthew. In Mark's gospel, in the first chapter, he makes it clear that Jesus' command to secrecy was an attempt to control the mob, which Jesus was ultimately not able to do. Most often, when Jesus commanded secrecy, the person healed disobeyed anyway, resulting in Jesus' ministry being hampered by miracle seekers. Matthew's focus is on the new identity of the kingdom and Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. In chapter 10, Jesus appoints the 12 and he gives them instructions before he sends them out. And this is a perfect example of how Matthew deals with the text differently. 
In Mark, Jesus gives two verses of instructions. In Luke, he gives three. In Matthew, there are 42 verses of detailed instructions. You see, Matthew's much more interested in what Jesus says. And so there, there we have it in Matthew. He tells them um, to only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, avoid Gentiles, avoid Samaritans. He tells them to take no provision. They're supposed to depend on Jewish hospitality. And once they get to a town, they're only supposed to stay in one house at a time. They shouldn't go door to door like beggars. So that's the instructions to the 12 as they start, uh, as they start out on their mission. He warns them that they're gonna be flogged in synagogues and that they're gonna be dragged in, in front of rulers and authorities. They're gonna to have to give an account. But Jesus says, don't worry. Don't ever worry. The words that they need will be given to them. In fact, the Father himself is gonna speak through them. In chapter 11, Matthew tells a story that none of the other gospels tell, and I have to confess, it's one of my favorite stories. In chapter four, Matthew told us that John, the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist, was arrested and put in prison. Now in chapter 11, John sends two of his disciples to Jesus with the most remarkable question in the New Testament. I know that's saying a lot, but this was the question from John the Baptist. Are you the Messiah or should we look for someone else? Now this is the person who leapt in his mother's womb when he got close to Jesus. This is the person who heard the voice of God say, this is my son. I mean, of all people, John the Baptist is doubting the identity of Jesus. And I think that's why Matthew's interested in this story. It's all about identity. Jesus sends a message back to John through his disciples. He says, tell John the things that you see, the blind see, the lame leap like deer, and the poor have the good news preached to them. So these are all the classic signs of the coming of the Messiah. And the last thing he says to John is, and blessed is he who doesn't stumble because of me. Blessed is he who is not confused about my identity. You see, Jesus is the stumbling stone. Isaiah said he would be. And Matthew is adamant that you and I understand the true identity of Jesus, the Messiah. The early part of chapter 11 in Matthew had been a real roller coaster emotionally for Jesus. He had to deal with uh, John's uh, difficult question as to whether he was the Messiah or not. And then he ended up by condemning two of the cities he had done his works in, one of them Capernaum, his own town, and the other city Chorazin, this, this city that we're, we're in now. So very emotional. So a little later on in the chapter, he steps back and it's almost as if he's talking to himself. He's reassuring himself and he thanks the father, his father, for revealing things to little children and for hiding them from the wise. And then he invites those who are weary, as, as he is weary at this moment, to come and find rest. Now he uses a very rabbinic word when he says, my yoke. The word yoke is, is universally understood as a reference to the law, the yoke of the law. But Jesus is introducing the new reality over the old orthodoxy, and his yoke is a source of rest. He encourages all of us to learn of him, to take his yoke, the new reality, on ourselves, because the only place we'll ever find rest. 